Okay. Now one of the things that we ask about in personality is, does our personality shape our situation or does our situation shape our personality? Let me give you an example. Here's a guy standing in his office. He seems pleased with his office. Let's examine the contents of his office. Um, let's start on the right hand side. He's got a cow skull hanging in the window with something hanging off one of the horns, a lava lamp next to it, some Christmas lights. He's got a piece of art, that's cool. We're wa working away at the top, we still see the Christmas lights. Some kind of, it looks like his diploma on the wall and then some kind of, looks like he went somewhere and brought home some folk art from wherever he went. Nice stack of books with a rock, no, a brain on top, nice. Right, like I'm seeing a lot of clutter at the higher levels and then oh my gosh, let's get to his desk. I mean, seriously, do you work at that desk? Because you, all you can really see is the keyboard. Like maybe all he does is type because he's just like piled things there. He's got his umbrella propped up against his desk, a paper bag that looks like maybe he's using it as a trash receptacle. I'm not sure. I mean, look at all the junk in this de in this office. It's a little, a little cluttered. Um, now it might be that this room reflects him, right? That maybe we're seeing the what his brain is like on the what his mind is like on the inside right this is him or it's also it's possible that being in a room that's cluttered like this is affecting the way he behaves that it that this room is affecting his thoughts his his emotions and his behaviors this is the trap this is the question in personality research in what in the field that we call social cognitive perspective we are trying to figure out the role of internal personal factors, environmental factors, and then, in, and then behaviors that you engage in. Now this model that you're seeing with these double-headed arrows illustrates a perspective in social cognitivism where we talk about reciprocal determinism. You're going to see this model again when we get to the social cognitive explanation for psychological disorders because we're really big on saying, well, see, yeah, there's probably biological factors that cause you to have certain predispositions. Like this person who's free climbing. No, oh, wait, no, I see a, ro I see a rope. Okay, so this guy who's rock climbing, uh, he probably has certain internal personality characteristics that make him different from a person who wouldn't want to go rock climbing, right? Maybe he he likes the thought of risky activities. That when he thinks about it, it brings up positive feelings that make him um, drawn toward the activity. Unlike me, where that thinking about doing that brings up negative thoughts. Like first off, probably tear off all my fingernails, tear off my fingers, don't like that idea right off. I haven't even discussed the height, right? <laughs> right off, don't want to be putting my fingers in the rocks. Um, <laughs> don't like the feeling of dry chocolate over my head. Like right away, I'm not thinking positive thoughts about it. And that may be some difference in us internally, right? Then we get into environmental factors. Okay, he, um, he probably has rock climbing friends. I have rock climbing friends. Uh, I, I live in a household full of people who enjoy rock climbing. My husband was a big rock climber. He and his buddy used to climb Yosemite all the time when we were in a uh, station in California. Um, took several trips down there since we left. And uh, my kids have climbed in Yosemite. And in fact, my daughter is a certified rock climbing instructor. I'm surrounded by people who like to rock climb. Uh, probably my environmental fra factors should be possibly affecting my behavior, right? My willingness to, to learn how to rock climb. Actually, uh, I still don't like the idea of getting my fingers and stuff all over the rock, but the thing I am willing to do, given that I'm in this situation where I've got, pe I'm surrounded by people who rock climb, um, and I don't really like the stuff that goes along with rock climbing, is I went ahead and learned how to belay. So that when everybody else is rock climbing, I'm the one who stays on the bottom and belays them. So that everybody gets to rock climb and I stay on the bottom. And then I feel like I'm doing something helpful and, you know, they feel like they're, they've got one over on me because they did the fun part, they think. Um, and everybody wins. But uh, so be, now, would I have ever learned how to belay if I hadn't been surrounded by rock climbing friends? Probably not. 
right? If it hadn't been, you know, like the environment affected my behavior just as much as my internal personal factors about not wanting to climb myself um, influenced my behavior. So this is what we talk about with social cognitive perspective. My behavior has influenced my attitude about the, beha about the um, behavior. So my internal personal factors were influenced by um, my, for one thing, I know that if, you know, you are, if you set everything up correctly, it's not that dangerous per se. Yeah, I mean, nothing's ever perfect. But it still doesn't override my general, I don't really like scraping my skin on rocks. So I'm just really not, you know, a huge fan. But, you know, my behavior, engaging in belaying, has affected, has softened my attitudes about rock climbing in general. And my attitudes about rock climbing in general um, probably were softened by being around people who rock climb, right? So you can kind of see how these things all interact and, and, and influence each other. It's not just a one-way arrow or a flow chart. Now, here's the thing. Now, this you'll notice this chart shows up at pretty much the end of every chapter, but when you think about personality, it's really important to remember this biopsychosocial approach issue. That definitely we've got to acknowledge that there have got to be biological influences on our personality. We also have to acknowledge there have got to be psychological influences, things that we've experienced and the way that we've interpreted those experiences, right? And then we also have to take into account the context in which we're raised and in which we're operating. Um, so this is truly one of those areas where you can't probably adequately describe um, the factors that go into personality without taking all three influences into, into consideration. Now, kind of separate from anything else that we've been talking about, I wanted to talk a little bit about the self, because this is part of a really important part of personality theory. Um, so, and this is actually something that also overlaps with uh, social psychology. So I wasn't really sure which chapter to put it in, um, because part of um, our sense of self is how aware we are of ourselves and how aware we are of our influence on other people and things like that. Now the spotlight effect shows us that we f um, feel like people are paying closer attention to us than they really are. It's like we think we have a spotlight on us and that other people who are equal to us, you know, we're all sitting in the audience someplace or um, we're all at the grocery stores and we feel like people are more likely to notice us because we're us. Um, this is an aspect of self-consciousness, how aware we are of whether we're likely to be noticed or drawing attention. Okay, so to test the spotlight effect, researchers had some students put on a Barry Manilow shirt. Now, if you don't know who Barry Manilow is, um, you know, Google him and listen to his song. It was classic 70s, um, you know, Copacabana, um, Mandy, you know, these crazy songs um, that were very popular in the 70s and became very unpopular very quickly. Like if, if you're a fan of low, they call you, um, there's a certain kind of kitschy quality to it. But if you just generally think his music's good, a lot of people are like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> this is so out of style, right? So for students to be wearing a Barry Manilow t-shirt like they like him, you know, a lot of the students were kind of embarrassed to have to put on a Barry Manilow shirt and go to class. So, but the spotlight effect makes these students think that people have their attention focused on them more than they probably really did. So the students went to class wearing their Barry Manilow shirt, thinking that everybody was going to notice that they were wearing a Barry Manilow shirt. In reality, people don't notice what we do very much at all. We think they will, but we really, they really don't. In the Barry Manilow t-shirt example, um, virtually no one in class noticed what t-shirt these students were wearing at all, but the students were very self-conscious wearing a Barry Manilow shirt. The good news is people don't really notice that much. I mean, people are self-absorbed. All of us are self-absorbed. So just as we're thinking that they're all noticing stuff about us, they think we're noticing stuff about them. So it's like this beautiful, we're all in our own little world, assuming we're more interesting than we really are. Now the spotlight effect helps to feed our, well, maybe it comes out of self-esteem you know, our belief that we are important, noteworthy, um, things like that. And, you know, high self-esteem is one thing, low self-esteem is another thing, right? Um, people who have high or normal levels of self-esteem tend to be more resistant to peer pressure. They feel more confident in their own judgment, basically. They are, if they are the victim or the target of a bully, 
they're much less likely to be harmed by it. They're much more likely to laugh it off or blow it off because they know that whatever the bully's trying to communicate to them is not valid. Um, they're more resilient in the face of stress. A person with normal to high levels of self-esteem, when they have something harmful happen, um, can marshal their resources to um, resist the effects, the negative effects. Now here's the thing about what I just, this nice list I just gave you, because it sounds like, well, gosh, then I want health, high self-esteem so I'll get these good outcomes. But it's unclear whether having high self-esteem causes the good outcomes or the good outcomes causes high self-esteem. We don't know which way, if there is a causal relationship, we have no idea which way it flows. Now, things that we know about people with lower self-esteem are um, people who have low self-esteem, we can induce a sense of low self-esteem temporarily in a person by telling them negative things. For example, we can tell them to write a, an essay and then we tell them that there's another participant in another room, they also wrote an essay, and you guys are going to exchange essays and give each other feedback about the quality of the essay. Um, unbeknownst to the participant, there is no one else. All there is is a standard assessment that's going to be placed in their envelope, and they're going to read that feedback. So to make it seem more realistic, the participant reads somebody else's essay, gives his feedback, and, and then the envelopes are traded back via the researcher. Like I said, nobody 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 read the participants essay at all all they did was slip a card in that said this is the worst essay I've ever read <laughs> like negative feedback um, when you induce low self-esteem through that kind of feedback and then give a person an opportunity to express prejudicial attitudes they will sh express greater prejudicial attitudes than people who were not induced into a lower self-esteem state so that sort of implies that self-esteem can, inf like maybe to boost our own self-esteem, we take it out on others. Um, that we might try and make our own light shine brighter by dimming someone else's light. Here's somebody with low self-esteem. Dear diary, sorry to bother you again. Um, people, <laughs> people who have low self-esteem oftentimes have low self-worth. Um, and so then they think negatively about themselves. Okay, now this I'd like to do in class. So uh, if you want to get out a paper and pencil, you can, um, using this scale from 1 to 9, rate yourself on these different characteristics that I'm going to mention. So 5 is going to be average. Anything below 5 is going to be below average. And we've got, I've got them labeled, you know, considerably well below average, well below average, below average, or slightly below average. And then we have the same basic um, headers on the right-hand side, but these would be ratings that are above average. So if you need to pause me so you can grab a piece of paper and a pencil to play along, go ahead and pause me. Okay, so presumably we're back. Okay, if you don't want to play along, that's okay. You can do it mentally. You're supposed to rate yourself on your leadership ability. Now think of yourself compared to other people of your same age and same sex. Just to keep it fair, same age, same sex on leadership ability, athletic ability, ability to get along with others, tolerance, energy level, helpfulness, responsibility, creativeness, I think the word's creativity, but I didn't make up this scale. <laughs> Nine is patience. Trustworthiness. Sincerity. Thoughtfulness. Cooperativeness. Reasonableness. Intelligence. Okay. Now what I want you to do, if you participated in this activity, add up all the scores that you gave and then divide that total by 15. So you can pause me again while you do your math. Add up all the, all the ratings that you gave, add up the scores, and then divide by 15. Okay, so presumably you're back and have done your math. Okay, now in class I always make people raise their hand um, if their score was under five and no one ever raises their hand. I have never once seen a student raise their hand for that. 
Okay, so you're, I'm sitting in a classroom of 42 people and not one of them is below average on average uh, across these 15 things. Now, of course, if we could break it down, we'd see that maybe you gave yourself a below 5 rating on something. Um, I, the last time I did this test in class, my son actually happened to be in the room waiting to carpool home when I administered this. And uh, so he took the scale. And he said the only thing he gave himself a score below five was leadership ability because he knew he doesn't tend to stand up and ask to be in leadership positions. But uh, even my own offspring didn't know this um, this self-serving bias well enough to stay away from the above five averages. Um, because the thing is, to preserve our self-esteem, we tend to all think we're above average, right? Now, what are we living in Lake Wobegon where all the children are good looking no all the people are good looking and the children are all above average I mean we can't all be above average it's called average for a reason right most of us must be average some of us are above and some of us are below but we all tend to think we're above average on pretty much everything here's Lucy I just think I have a knack for seeing other people's faults Linus says what about your own faults and she says I have a knack for overlooking them uh, that's the self-serving bias we notice our successes and we ignore our failures. This helps us to defend our self-esteem. Oh, kind of sounds like something Freud would say, right? We try and protect our ego. Well, the self-serving bias says we try and protect our self-esteem by ignoring our failures or our shortcomings and emphasizing our successes or our strong points. Okay, so here's a nice little picture that illustrates this. Okay, so we'll, stop with, we're, we'll start with the guy at the top. And he goes, at least I'm not as dumb as she is. And she says, well, at least I'm not old like her. The old lady says, I'm not poor like that bum. And then the bum says, my life is easier than that tragic soul. And the person in the wheelchair says, I may be in a wheelchair. Whoops, I went to push the wrong button. Sorry. Ah, ah, don't do that. Okay, and then the person in the wheelchair, where are we? says, I may be in a wheelchair, but I'm happier than that guy. And then that guy says, I'm very well read and much more educated than most. And then this person says, I'm nicer than my backstabbing ex-boyfriend. And then this person says, I'm not as fat as that dude. <laughs> well, at least I'm not as dumb as she is. Right? We all have someone to compare ourselves to so that we can boost our self-esteem and not have to feel bad about ourselves. And, you know, I have to say, it's a good it's a good strategy. One of the things about the self-serving bias is it allows us to keep striving in the, in the face of challenge. And so I always encourage, like students, when you um, do poorly on a test, you know, be honest about possibly it's because you didn't study well enough or something like that, but don't be, focus on something temporary. Focus on something like, I didn't study as much as I should have, rather than I'm not smart enough for this. Because if you do something global, if you make a global attribution that is negative, it will undermine your um, energy levels and your striving. If you blame it on something temporary, like I didn't study enough or I didn't realize that's what the test was going to be about or something like that, then you're going to be willing to strive again in the future. Okay, so I think I've been talking for quite a while, so I need to take a break. So let's take a break and then we'll come back and talk about narcissism. Oh yeah, I need to stop.